Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 2nd of May and my wife made me this t-shirt in case you're wondering. She thinks it's funny, I do all these YouTube videos where I'm a huge introvert in real life. So there you go. Um, as always, if this is useful, a like, subscribe, comment and share is appreciated. Make sure you hit that bell to get notified when I release new things and when I do live events because this week, from a new video's perspective, I posted a video all about IP subnetting. It's nearly an hour long, which is a really long time to talk about IP subnetting. But people had actually asked me to create this content because they'd been struggling with the SIDAR ranges. What is a slash 28? Why do I use it? How many IPs do I actually get? What does it mean for the network addresses? So I go into all of the detail and I show a few Azure specific things as well. And then to celebrate that 50,000 subscribers, I did an Ask Me Anything session on Wednesday. So it was actually a lot of fun. A lot of people joined live. It's had nearly 10,000 views now uh, since Wednesday, but a lot of good questions. I was sitting down. I had my COVID second shot that actually made me pretty sick. Um, so it wasn't as good as I'd hoped it would be, but it was fun. And so I'll do another one. Uh, again, people have asked me to, to repeat. And then Thursday, I posted a new video all about the new secrets management module for PowerShell, which essentially abstracts the technology used to actually store the secrets, be it credential manager or file or key vault or Hitachi, but whatever that might be, it abstracts that away to give me a common set of commands. So I go through that in that video. New features. So on the compute side, a fairly big announcement around the new V5 for the D and E series. Now these are in preview, you have to sign up for these. But if we go and quickly look at what the blog sort of told us about this, what it's going to actually give us is, we think about a 15% performance increase over the current V4 offerings. And of course we have both the D and the E. So we think about the D for general purpose. And as it's becoming more common, what we're going to see are versions with a little d and without a little d. Remember, with d means we get that local temporary storage. Without that little d, it has no local temporary storage. So we have the D series between 2 to 96 virtual CPUs up to 384 gigabytes of memory. And then the memory intensive workloads, the E series, which once again, has the kind of D and non-D version, and also both have the S and the non-S that lets me use premium storage and ultra disks. Once again, now up to 96 virtual CPUs and up to 672 gigabytes of memory. So this is a private preview, go and sign up for this, available in only certain regions right now. It is built on the third gen uh, Intel Xeon scalable processors, the Ice Lake processors. I think it's a 3.5 gigahertz turbo clock speed. There's a lot of other features that bring us uh, new performance benefits. So those are available in preview. And then Azure Hybrid Benefit for Linux now applies to reserved instances and virtual machine scale sets as well. So this was launched originally back in November uh, 2020. And it lets you have that Azure hybrid benefit for the Linux customers. You can bring your on-premises Red Hat Enterprise subscriptions to Azure. That was really just for pay-as-you-go VMs. Now I can also bring that for my reserved instances where I make that three-year, five-year kind of pre-commit or my virtual machine scale sets for that Red Hat Enterprise Linux and the SUSE Linux Enterprise. You don't have to provide your own image. You can use Azure Marketplace, um, you can use through the Azure portal, but now obviously you're just bringing your existing licenses with you, applies to more things. On the storage side, Azure SQL Hyperscale, remember Hyperscale is that very scalable from a both compute and storage perspective, it gives me up to 100 terabyte of database, way beyond the general purpose, the business critical, well, now for that hyperscale, I can actually have active geo-replication. 
so I can have an async replication to either in the same region or another region, a readable copy of the database. That will now, in the event of a region failure, I could fail over to that, but it's really giving me that automatic, very easy to set up ability to add that new replica. And again, it is readable, that second copy. You might put it in the same region if I had like a really heavy read workload that I wanted to separate from the primary database. But typically, you're going to put it in another region for that resiliency. Ultradisk now is available in North Central US. Remember, Ultradisk is not just the highest performing, lowest latency disk. What's really nice about Ultradisk is it has independent dials. Normally, we think about as the capacity grows, so too do the IOPS and the throughput. With Ultradisk, I can actually turn those dials pretty much independently. So I pick a capacity, I pick the IOPS, I pick the throughput. And I can change those dials, the IOPS and the throughput, while it's running. And that's important because of the way it's built. So I could actually, for peak times when I need high throughput, when I need high IOPS, hey, I turn the dials up. When that peak time's over, I can turn them back way down. And I can automate that through things like Azure Functions or Logic Apps I can call through PowerShell or the RESTful APIs to change those dynamically. So Ultradisk's super useful for very high performance, but I can change it while it's running. Miscellaneous. Azure Monitor Log Alerts, i.e. Log Analytics, which is now under that Azure Monitor brand, it's alerting. And there's two features that are now in preview. The first is I can now do a one minute frequency for that kind of polling to generate the alert. And then I can now have stateful log alerts. Now what's super important here, this one minute frequency is not changing the time to actually get to log analytics. We always think about typically Azure Monitor metrics, that inbuilt time series database, we call it a fast metric pipeline because things will show up there very, very quickly from the source resources, and we can trigger alerts from there. And then secondarily, we can also then send them to log analytics. This one minute is not saying, hey, it's gonna to get to log analytics quicker. It's not that at all. It's about when we configure the alerts, I can now go down, instead of five minutes being the smallest interval, I could actually go down to a minute. Maybe it's easier to see. If we jump back over to the portal, and all I'm gonna do super, super quickly is if we just look at a log analytics. So if I go and look at log analytics workspace, which again is Azure monitor logs. I'll just pick a workspace. It really doesn't matter what we're doing here. I'll go to logs and I'll quickly open up really any query. It doesn't matter, put VMs, oh, yeah, DC memory. And if I just run that. So that's just memory from uh, a domain controller. But from here, once we actually have a query with results, we can go and create an alert rule. So we have this, and it uses the common set. This is using Azure Monitor Alerts. So now I'm creating it from a scope using my workspace, and I have a condition. And the key point here is what this is giving me is for this frequency, you can see right now, the lowest number is every five minutes. What this change is gonna do is actually change that. I could go all the way down to one minute. So it's how often it's actually going and checking to see, hey, has this fired yet? And then the stateful log alert, today if an alert fires because that condition is true, well, it, it stays true. Now, if a condition evaluates to true when it's fired, when that condition is no longer true, the monitor condition is actually changed to resolved. So it's stateful. This is not available in the portal UI. You'll have to use the uh, APIs to actually configure that. But those are the two big changes around those Azure Monitor log alerts. Application Insights now has work item integration. So we think about what is a work item? When I'm doing development, I find a problem, something I need to resolve, I can create a work item in my DevOps tool. This could be GitHub, it could be Azure DevOps. 
Remember, application insights is that set of instrumentation I can run in my application that helps me gather performance problems, if there's bugs, if there's problems on the client side. With this integration from App Insights, it can actually go and create those work items for me in either Azure DevOps or GitHub. It can include things like KQL queries to actually bring data into that work item. It has different icons for if it's Azure DevOps or if it's GitHub. I can deploy this with ARM templates. I can set advanced attributes like an assignee, like a milestone, like a project. I can create workbook templates. All of these great things now very seamlessly integrated in together. For Azure Site Recovery, remember Azure Site Recovery is that ability to replicate OS instances, maybe from on-premises to Azure or Azure to Azure. It now has Proximity Placement Group support, and that's GA. Remember, Proximity Placement Groups are about keeping things close together. I can create a Proximity Placement Group, and then when I add things into that, it's gonna try and keep them very close together in terms of latency. There's been various tests done, but it's way, way below even a millisecond. It's gonna keep them super close together. So now what I can do with Azure Site Recovery is I can specify a proximity placement group for that failover. Now it's a best efforts. If it can't get it in the proximity placement group, it won't fail the failover, but it's gonna try as best it can to go to my desired PPG that I configure as part of that failover and fail back. Replication cross continents. Now ordinarily with Azure Site Recovery, I pick where I want to replicate to and it's typically within the continent. What they've now lit up is cross-continent for a couple of pairs. So if we actually go and look at the link, they have a support matrix for this. It shows you the geographic clusters that we can normally replicate between. So anything in Americas, Europe, Asia, Australia, etc. So now it's talking about these new pairings here so Southeast Asia and Australia East, Southeast Asia and Australia Southeast, West Europe and South Central US. Now I could actually add that cross-continent replication for Azure Site Recovery. They are expecting to add more to this in the future. This is what's going on now. That matrix will be changed as they add more regions to that cross-continent pairing. And there's now an actual Azure policy in preview to help me automatically onboard things to Azure Site Recovery as I create the virtual machines. If we go and jump over to the portal and we'll go and look at Azure policy. So we'll go over here. If I just go and look at my definitions and I can quickly just search for disaster. There we go. Configure disaster recovery on virtual machines by enabling replication. There's parameters I would pass, obviously source region, target region, resource group, what vault to use, availability zone, but it's going to deploy if not exists. This will actually therefore go and set up based on these parameters I configure, ASR for me automatically you can see this whole big definition of what it's gonna do. You can see the deployment all through here, lots and lots of things. But it'll actually go and automatically set that up for whatever VMs I actually now create um, automatically. So all good stuff. And then finally, this week, there was the April 2021 cost management update really two big things in here. Firstly, if you're using the APIs, now I can actually get prices in non-US dollars. So previously it would give me only USD pricing, now it's any supported currency. And in the cost analysis preview, it has a new little date picker. So you can see here, it's actually showing, hey, this is what this looks like. Just a, a nicer interface to go and pick those dates for where you're doing your cost analysis. Cost Management Labs has a bunch of changes made to it, but that's really the, the main things 
uh, that were part of that update, but I'll add the link in the description as usual. Just you can go and get all the detail if you want to. And that's it. That's all the changes for this week. I hope that was useful. Uh, as always, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you on the next video.